This is Dennis Ramundi. I'm here with my co-host, Phil Goldberg. Our podcast, Spirit Matters, found at spiritmatterstalk.com. Uh, before we begin, I want to thank all the people that have uh, contributed and subscribed to our uh, podcast. And I uh, ask that you continue to do that. And our new that. YouTube channel. And, and our YouTube channel. And if you go to YouTube and go to Spirit Matters Talk, uh, Spirit Matters Talk, three words, uh, you'll find us there. Uh, our guest today, uh, Francis Xavier Clooney. He is a Jesuit priest uh, and a scholar uh, teachings in te teachings of Hinduism. He's currently a professor at Harvard uh, Divinity School in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, he is an author. Uh, his most recent books uh, are Western Jesuit Scholars in India, teaching, uh, tracing their paths, reassessing their goals. His uh, other book that's currently out, reading the Hindu and Christian classics, why and how deep learning still matters. He has an amazing background. He's been all over the world. And uh, anyone who's not familiar with Jesuit priests, I can tell you one thing. Uh, they are very, very scholarly. Uh, they've done a lot of study. And there's pretty much nothing you can throw at them uh, in terms of uh, spiritual inquisition that they don't handle well. And I, I also want to add that the current Pope, Pope Francis, is the first Jesuit uh, Pope. And so uh, uh, they have qu uh, qu quite a background, quite a history. Uh, thank you so very much for, take, for taking the time to come on with us today. Thank uh, you. Dennis, you may, you may want to avoid the word inquisition. Well, I meant it in only the best <laughs> possible way. <laughs> uh, Thank you, uh, Professor Clooney, for giving us permission to call you Frank, and we will. Uh, Frank, we always like our listeners to uh, learn something about the, the spiritual uh, background of our guests and the uh, main influences that brought them to the work that they do. Can you give us a bit of an overview of your uh, rather interesting background. I will, I'll try to do it briefly and then you can ask questions that can expand it and elaborate on it. Um, so I think there were, as I see it now, when I look back over my life, two major strands. So one is growing up in middle-class Irish Catholic New York, born in Brooklyn, growing up on Staten Island and going through the, the grammar, Catholic grammar school a Jesuit Catholic high school, Regis in Manhattan, Fordham College, sort of, you know, the whole uh, Jesuit Catholic world, pre-Vatican II, Vatican II, post-Vatican II, I graduated from high school in 1968, and a fairly traditional Catholic learning. And then right after high school, I became a Jesuit, entered the seminary. And then as now we have a long uh, course of training, it took me 10 years to be ordained a priest, uh, 10 years later with a lot of Greek and Latin, a lot of philosophy, a lot of theology, all of that. So that's all sort of in place is the, the Catholic identity that I still have. I'm still a practicing priest, even while at Harvard, I have a parish connection in a parish I've been going to for almost 25 years south of Boston. So all of that's sort of in place. But I think the that has always been either in tension with or in creative harmony with my first experience after college when I graduated from Fordham as a young Jesuit, for various reasons I won't go into unless you're interested, I went off to Kathmandu for two years. And so from 73 to 75, I was teaching at St. Xavier's School in Kathmandu. Teaching is part of the Jesuit training. I could have done it in New York, but I did it in Kathmandu instead. And I think what happened there was that the, the two kind of, uh, the two rivers or two flows of my Catholic Jesuit training. And then suddenly in the middle of it, this unanticipated awakening by discovering the rest of the world. All the boys I taught in Kathmandu, teenagers uh, were Hindu and Buddhist. And suddenly being in a Hindu Buddhist culture, uh, going to the temples, the festivals, visiting the Tibetan monastic communities, all this kind of stuff happening, suddenly was side by side with my Catholic identity in a way that I found to be quite illuminating and quite um, enriching. And then what happened then after I was ordained a priest and had done this time in Kathmandu, 
I went for a PhD in Indian studies, South Asian studies at the University of Chicago, which was a way of kind of using my classical training, my Greek and Latin, now adding to it Sanskrit and Tamil, and trying really having a kind of scholastic learning and crossing the boundaries tradition-wise as, as my professional study. And by the time I finished grad school in 84, having gone back to India for a year and a half, it was sort of in place that I would be a scholar, as, as Dennis described me, who does Hinduism and comparative work. I teach courses on Hinduism, courses in comparative theology, bringing the Catholic and the Hindu traditions together academically in the classroom as I had done so in my own life. So that's a starting point. I, I wanted to uh, follow up. Uh, I, I read that uh, you taught, I believe, at Xavier High School in uh, Kathmandu. And um, that uh, in, in order to, uh, and, and Hinduism, Buddhism was relatively new to you at the time. And, and uh, your first exposure to uh, Vedic literature, as I understand it, was uh, when you were teaching moral values to the students and you used the Bhagavad Gita. Mm -hmm. uh, is that the case? And, and uh, what brought that about and how did you do that? Yeah, well, this, this was the, um... I mean, in part, it was the experience that any young person has in teaching high school. So I was 22 when I got there. Mm -hmm. The students were in their teens. Uh, sink or swim, figure out how to teach. Uh, right. Because even though they were more polite and well-behaved in Kathmandu, they still were testing me and pushing back and so on. And one of the required courses that I was given to teach to the, I guess, sophomore class, equivalent of sophomore class, was called moral science. And it was part of the, the trade-off with the king of Nepal, who in 1950 had invited the Jesuits in to set up the school. You can teach them anything you want. You can educate them. We want them to learn English. We want them to know literature, science, and so on. Just don't proselytize and try to convert them. And the Jesuits said, oh, that's fine. We can do that. And But the, the text used, as used at many of the schools in India, was not, therefore, a Christian catechism nor the Hindu text, but rather this kind of neutral book of moral science. Why be good? Why tell the truth? Uh, why be a good citizen and so on? And I found it, and my students found it really boring. It was abstract, it was conceptual, didn't belong to my tradition or to their tradition. So I thought, can I do this better? And I thought, well, what if I was in New York, I would be drawing on biblical stories, lives of saints and so on, to, to illustrate the ethical path and said, well, how about learning from their traditions? And so I, the first book I did pick up was the Bhagavad Gita, which I had read once, I think, before going to India, uh, Nepal, and, and began to dig into the early chapters, particularly about jnana yoga, karma yoga, uh, bhakti, and then also brought in Jataka tales, lives of the Buddha, and so on as moral lessons. And it worked marvelously. Um, if it was for me learning these texts for the first time, as they say, you often learn something best when you teach it, trying to figure out how to talk about this in the classroom. But they responded to it. They liked the fact that their traditions were now having a place in the classroom in this Catholic school. Um, and it led to many further deeper encounters about religion between me and these boys and then meeting their families and so on. But it really was built around the Bhagavad Gita and a few texts like that that made the whole project take off. Interesting. Uh, Frank, I first became aware of you and your work when I was uh, researching American Veda 12 years ago or so. Mm -hmm. And I was struck to learn there was a uh, professor at Harvard Divinity School who was also a Jesuit priest who wrote books with titles like Hindu Wisdom for All God's Children and uh, Theology After Vedanta, and a, a book called Divine Mother, Blessed Mother, which is about Hindu goddesses, and uh, Mother Mary. And um, I was curious then, and I'm curious now, and want to share with our audience how your discovery and study of the Hindu traditions uh, affected your your own Catholicism and uh, your teaching of, of both traditions? Hmm. I think, I mean, I would say two things, and going back to really where we started about my personal experience growing up, is that 
Um, I was never really in the position of as many young people of, you know, in the 60s and 70s were, a seeker looking to the East for a wisdom to live by. Because I had a, a durable Catholic training, Catholic background, which was fine with me. But what I found, and I will answer your question, was that that Catholic grounding gave me a base from which to approach the Hindu traditions and Buddhist traditions of Nepal without fear, without, um, without becoming a Hindu or Buddhist, with, but without seeing them as rivals or without having to do something about them, that I had a base from which to explore. And what I found even there was that um, what was productive for me was not to be simply a Catholic who had abstract ideas about Hinduism and Buddhism, or convert to Hinduism or Buddhism, but rather to, to have this kind of metaphor of crossing the boundaries back and forth. And I think what happened to me then when I started, um, you know, finished grad school, got to Boston College where I taught for 21 years before coming to Harvard, was to, um, to write in that way where the two traditions were always visible in my writing. And so uh, in the book you mentioned, Theology After Vedanta, 1993, to spend a lot of time reading Shankara, uh, commentaries on the Upanishads, Brahma Sutras, the style of scholastic Hinduism and so on, bringing that into dialogue in the last chapter with Thomas Aquinas. And, and not, not saying all that Shankara was trying to do is now perfected or completed in Aquinas, but rather read somebody of your own tradition, for me Aquinas, read Shankara and then read them together. And then the, um, the book, just for another example, the uh, Divine Mother, Blessed Mother, Hindu Goddesses, and the Virgin Mary. <clears throat> I grew up again in a Catholic church that was in great change in the 60s from pre-Vatican II to post-Vatican II. <laughs> but I found that um, in my roots in the 50s and May Day ceremonies and crownings of Mary, rosaries in October and so on, this whole kind of Catholic sense of the, we can't say the divine feminine, but a, a very superior feminine, the, the Mother Mary, the figure who is there next to Jesus and sometimes a larger statue and so on. When I got to India, um, when I got to Nepal first and then to India, going to goddess temples, there was kind of a sense of a spark or a recognition that I had somewhere to locate the goddesses, not as Indiana Jones kind of esoteric or weird or terrible, but somehow here was the supreme feminine in certain Hindu traditions in Bengal and Tamil Nadu that I could sort of reflect and radiate with the sense of the Virgin Mary in my own tradition. And what happened in that, on the one side, it gave me a way of thinking about goddesses without being terrified by them and without kind of needing to explain them away or only as metaphors or something. But it also helped me to revive a sense of where the Virgin Mary would fit in my life as a Jesuit post-Vatican II, less pious church, that there's a way of thinking about why goddesses matter to Hindus and why Mary matters to Catholics. And it sort of, it brought it all to life. Can and I, I think, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yes. Okay. I was just going to say that, that, that those are examples of the dynamic of what I call comparative theology, where, again, you don't obliterate either tradition, but you keep them alive and near to each other. And the creativity is the dynamic back and forth between the two. And I assume, how did that affect your own uh, practice of Catholicism is, is one question, but, and the other is, uh, on the surface, somebody might say, well, how, how can you reconcile this uh, non-dual Vedanta and what seems to be a supremely dualistic uh, tradition of, of Catholicism? So how did you deal with that and, and how has, did it affect your own practices? I mean, on, on, the, on the latter point, I think in terms of what I did, so my early work and the book Theology After Vedanta was all about Shankara and reading the Upanishads. I think because I was, um, because of a Roman Catholic, but also because I was also reading Tamil literature and devotional literature, Tamil and the Vaishnava tradition, Rama, Krishna, Vishnu, Narayana, Lakshmi, that the theistic side of Vedanta came to the fore. So the school of Ramanuja. Uh, his version of, of, of Vedanta that the Upanishads and Gita speak to, of the reality of Krishna, the re reality of Vishnu. That while I found um, both Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta, and the Purva Mimamsa ritualistic thinking that is so important for Vedanta, 
mind clearing, bracing, opening up, that kind of stripping away all kinds of wrong ideas about the East, that my intuition uh, went eventually more toward the devotional and theistic Vedanta. So I think I moved in that direction while writing on the Tamil poetry and so on as well. What did this do for me as a Catholic? Um, as I mentioned at the start, I'm still a Catholic priest. Um, so 53 years a Jesuit, 43 years a priest. Um, I never, again, I like unlike many of my peers, you know, 1970, a lot of young people were seekers and became Hare Krishnas and shaved their heads and were Buddhist monks and so on like that. I was kind of old fashioned enough that I was Catholic and still am Catholic. But I think in some sense, therefore, you could say, well, nothing has changed, except I'm this kind of weird Catholic priest who spent 40 years studying Hinduism, going to India. <laughs> um, and it's all, it's sort of all there. Like you are, you're, what I'm really saying is not choose one or the other, but be in one and then bring the other into your reality. And so, you know, Catholic masses, we don't believe in long sermons on Sunday. We have short homilies. And I think rarely do I ever get to the point of talking about Hinduism in my homilies because they're short. But I, it's rare that I look at a biblical reading without thinking of Hindu parallels. And I think reading the Gita, reading the Upanishads, reading Ramayana, Mahabharata, and so on, has awakened for me a way of detecting kind of the spiritual roots in a sacred text and probably helped me to be more serious about reading the Bible and finding what's alive in it, spiritually alive, and then ritually going to a ton of temples in India and rituals and festivals has enabled me as a priest, well, what am I doing when I'm at the altar? What, what exactly are the sacraments of the Catholic Church? Seeing them in a much richer and multidimensional way than I would have seen them if I had simply only been Catholic and only known Catholic masses and so on like that. The fact that I endlessly would go into temples and be respectful and circumambulate and so on gave me a whole new dimension to what ritual and sacraments is about as a Catholic. So I, I think it's kind of expanded my Catholicism without destroying my Catholicism. Let, let, let me ask you then, uh, did you receive, uh, have you over the years received any pushback from uh, uh, folks in the church, maybe from different denominations or whatever, that uh, different uh, orders where, where uh, you're taking this compar comparison of Catholicism and Hinduism or Buddhism too far. And if somebody comes to you who's a Catholic and says, uh, what is too far? Where, where, where am I crossing the line where I'm no longer, you know, I'm, I'm compromising on my practice or beliefs as a, as a Catholic and moving into to the beliefs of, of Hinduism? Are there lines like that? Well, I, I'd say on, on the two points, I mean, on the, on the second point first, maybe, that I always encourage people to be really careful about interreligious learning, that it's a good thing. It doesn't mean, therefore, do it. Uh, yeah, and usually it's, it's, it's Catholics asking me this question. Um, don't do it recklessly. Don't do it as if it doesn't really matter. But, and don't push yourself too far. So if I take a group of students to a mosque, and that we're there for Friday prayer, and, the, and the, clearly the, the congregation, the men usually that we're with, want us to come and line up to join the prayer, I tell the students, never do this unless you feel comfortable doing it. If you don't feel comfortable, stay in the back. Um, if you come to the Hindu temple, yes, if you come inside, you have to take your shoes off, but you don't have to do reverent gestures, you don't have to circumambulate, you don't have to accept the prasad from the priest and so on. Go only as far as you are ready. And, and theoretically, I'll say sometimes that in order to be a good interreligious learner, you have to go deeper into your own tradition. And if you don't have depth in your own, you can either lose what you have or spoil your encounter with the other. So go deeper and engage. And I think because I've talked about it in these terms over the years, and my writing is um, often heavily Indological. There's a lot about Hinduism in the books I do. It doesn't seem to have rung any alarm bells, let's say, in the authorities of the church in Rome or the Vatican. Um, the unkind way of saying that would be that my books aren't bestsellers and therefore <laughs> I'm not worried about any ruining life. But um, I think I sometimes I think I'm saying fairly radical things about interreligious learning, but I always make it clear that it doesn't change the Catholic faith. It doesn't do away with the truth of the gospel. Mm -hmm. It changes 
the whole thing. But I don't know if, if they, they think, oh, it doesn't change anything, therefore it's not radical. I think it doesn't change anything and it is radical. But in any case, I, I've gotten, you know, occasionally I'll get a, an angry letter from somebody who talks about, you know, uh, satanic Jesuits and the awful things you people are doing and you're ruining the church. But that's, I think, everybody gets something. Every like Jesuit that. gets those. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Every author not, gets Nothing too much. <laughs> nothing too much. Um, Frank, speaking of, of the gospel, um, one of the fun points of, well, to me fun, uh, of interaction I see with Christians and Hindus sometimes is the Hindu willingness to accept Jesus as a divine incarnation but not the only one. And how, how has that um, Jesus as one and only son of God and the Hindu uh, pantheon of avatars and divine incarnations, how have you dealt with that in your work? Yeah, that's a, a hot question. Um, I'm, I'm actually teaching my course this semester called Krishna and Christ. Oh, great. And, and the month of April is largely dedicated to talking about avatara and incarnation, ranging from chapter uh, in four of the Bhagavad Gita, chapter one of the Gospel of John, commentaries on both sides, some of the theological controversies and so on like that. And I, I think in some ways um, it, it becomes very clear right away, looking at the secondary literature, Catholic and Christian thinkers are largely very concerned to say these are different because... Christ, the Son of God came once, was incarnate once, died once, rose once, and saved the world by that event. It's not repeatable, and avatars are something else. Whereas we, we read some things by um, you know, 19th century thinkers, but also Swami Vivekananda, um, Swami Satprakashananda has a very interesting essay on avatar and incarnation. And it's just the default instinct on the Hindu side to say, yes, Jesus is an avatar, Jesus is an incarnation, and so are there are others. And I think in some ways, you know, the hard, you know, whichever side of my brain is the hard intellectual side, saying that at some point you can say, here are the thousand differences between what Hindu theologians have said about avatar and here's what Christians have said about the incarnation. And all these differences add up, and there are questions about one life, many lives, uh, the reality of the body of the avatar. All of this stuff would lead you to say, no, these are conceptually not even the same. But on the level of, of affect or the level of kind of emotional response, there's a kind of recognition that there's something about Krishna and something about Jesus that are not entirely dissimilar. And while there may be the theological frames that make them hard to understand, and I think you have to be careful because you don't want to ruin both of them by saying they're the same or something. Somehow to be able to say, we think we understand fully the incarnation with a capital I and the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus as a one-time event. Can't we learn something from the teachings on Rama, Krishna, other avatars about the repeated presence of the Lord in the world, or the repeated ways in which God constantly is coming back into the world? rather than saying it happened once 2,000 years ago and then was given to the church to administer. No, the, the, the incarnating of the word is happening. I think that can be said in a way that doesn't disrespect the Christian sense of once for all time. But the Hindu understanding of avatar opens it up and gives us a much greater freedom to imagine what we think we're talking about when we talk about the incarnation. Uh, it, along these lines, if someone were to come to you who's a Hindu, and maybe somebody taught, maybe someone, uh, you know, just from somewhere, someone recommends they come to you and they, they decide they want to become a Catholic. They want to get baptized and they understand it. They understand uh, uh, what it means to become a Catholic, but they don't want to let go of their beliefs in uh, uh, Hindu deities uh, or, or, or uh, Buddha. Uh, can they become a Catholic? Well, this is, this is a, uh, a form of a very old question. I think you would know that the first Jesuit to leave Europe was Francis Xavier, St. Francis Xavier, mm -hmm. who went to India. And throughout the 16th, 17th, 18th century, there are a host of missionaries who went to India. And some of the greatest figures, um, Robert de Nobili, I'm thinking of in particular in the 17th century, like Matteo Ricci in China, tried to argue that converting to Christianity 
was possible in a way that would leave your culture intact, your family intact, many of the customs of your tradition intact. You didn't have to make a rupture and break everything, burn everything, but you could have continuity. And so the, the, uh, it's controversial even now, but uh, Catholic Brahmins, Catholic Brahmins wearing their thread, uh, shaving their heads, uh, having reverence for their family customs and so on. But you're pushing it further by saying, well, what about, can I become a Christian and still be a devotee of Krishna or Rama? I, I, uh, devotee, devotee may be too strong a word. Uh, I still have that belief that, that uh, they are there and uh, they can be prayed to li like a saint sort of in Catholicism. Yeah. I mean, I, I think with somebody who came to me, I would obviously, as anybody would in counseling somebody, I mean, try to get to know why they're thinking of this major move of, of mm -hmm. converting, changing from one religion to another. What is going on in their lives spiritually mm -hmm. that is calling them to make take this step? Because as, as I said before, I mean, so many Hindus have enormous respect for Jesus Christ, but don't feel inclined to become Christians. Um, what is it that they're being called to? And then how how in that discernment of what they're being called to and being called to enter the uh, Catholic uh, Christian faith of some sort, what exactly are they also feeling about the respect for the deities, the family guru, the traditions they belong to? And I would say that um, on the one hand, uh, it would have to be some language like you're saying that they're, they're now, you know, they have the, 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 the central deity of their life, the soul, lord is christ if they're mm -hmm. a christian but that that could be compatible with continuing to have respect for even affection for you know uh, the books the festivals the temples and the deities in the temple to which they had previously belonged or had affiliation and it's even easier if you talk about they practice yoga or they study the upanishads i mean those things don't have to be left behind or radically broken but one does have to say, if I'm going to be sincere about converting from one faith to another, I have to be admitting that I'm changing not only to a new faith, but I'm changing my relationship to the faith of my family and my tradition. But I wouldn't urge them to say, the only way to become a Christian is to denounce or deny entirely the reality of the, of your, of the, the Hindu deities to whom you previously were committed. Be, you know, go slowly and and likewise say mm -hmm. you know all right you're being called to christ you're not ready to leave behind the temple practices of your hindu faith well then don't become a christian yet i mean give it two more years like see how it ripens and see if you grow toward a deeper christian commitment or simply respect for jesus as a hindu you don't have to rush into converting if you're not ready if you are mm -hmm. ready you should be able to say to yourself and to your family this is how I now relate to the deities of the Hindu tradition. And in reverse, well, it's not entirely in reverse, but um, I've been to uh, Christian ashrams in India, and I'm sure you have too. And you pro you've probably went, I don't know if you knew Bede Griffith, but you- Met him once. Uh, but you know of him and his work. Um, so at, there are examples, especially among the Jesuits, of people uh, going to India and taking on sort of Hindu uh, practices and uh, uh, customs. Um, in that regard, when I was reading your website earlier uh, to prepare for this, I, I saw mention of <clears throat> what you call the a Jesuit Pan-Asian discourse on reincarnation. And I'm very curious about that, what that is and what's that, what that's about. Well, I think, I mean, it was eye-opening for me when I first started looking into this because as I, as I mentioned before, the, there were these, you know, uh, paragons of inculturation, interreligious dialogue, like Robert De Nobili in India, Matteo Ricci in China, uh, Ippolito Desideri in 18th century Tibet, and so on. Figures who made, bent over backwards and learned the languages, the culture, and wanted to be part of it. But what was notable when you read their writings, like De Nobili's writings that I was reading in Tamil, you know, he wrote books in the Tamil language so that they could be read locally, were all 
aiming at cultural appropriation, culture, cultural rapprochement, but then got to the polemic stage of attacking idolatry and reincarnation. And they're fairly unrelenting. And this is, you know, this is uh, 17th century, so I'm not talking about Jesuits today. But the idea that um, there are certain intellectual philosophical problems with both the idea of rebirth and the idea of images, mortis, idols, and temples that are simply irrational and that any rational person would give up on these things whether or not they became a Christian. So the, unfortunately, I think in a way in the age of dialogue, the pan-Asian discourse on reincarnation is largely negative. Um, they're adapting and um, finding ways to be at home in the culture and help people to make the transition. But arguing, I think partly because they're thinking back to the question of avatar and incarnation, um, Christ came and died for us once, there is no need for rebirth. And also rebirth is not rational, rebirth doesn't work, it doesn't fit Aristotelian to mystic metaphysics and psychology. But they were fairly, they believed that they could talk somebody out of believing in such things. And sometimes like th there were debates about rebirth and so on, uh, arguments, you know, as you'd have Catholic and Lutheran pastors in Reformation Europe arguing with each other about doctrines, you'd see this happening in India, China, Japan, and so on like that. In the modern period, I think when you get to the 20th century, uh, both Western Jesuits, but also now, as you know, there are, you know, the largest number of Jesuits in the world are Indian Jesuits, over 4,000. Wow. The largest number in any country. I think are either, you know, if they're scholars, are much more sensitive to the fact that these cultural paradigms about birth and death, one life, many lives, are not going to be solved by my clever arguments overwhelming you. But rather, we have to put these in context about how it fits into a whole way of life and a whole view of human nature. And you don't see, at least in Catholic circles in India, including Jesuit, you don't see these kind of polemic arguments anymore. Even though it's pretty hard for a, a Christian to say, I believe in my previous lives, or, I understand my rebirth and so on like that. You don't see much of that either, but the attacks are not being done by Catholics or Jesuits at this point. Phil, do you have any uh, final questions you'd like to? I do. Um, uh, Frank, you're, you're very much uh, a leader in, in uh, what seems to be a developing uh, a discipline in academia called comparative theology. I'm curious what that is and how it compares to what we're, most of us are familiar with in terms of comparative religion. Religion, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it, it has a certain um, <clears throat> context to it that, um, you know, until, <clears throat> let's say, the 17th, 18th century, most of the study of religion in the West was done by believing Christians. And there was a very kind of strong overlap between the church, the faith, the Bible, how we thought about the beginning of the world, how we thought about creation, how we thought about everything tied in. And with the uh, Enlightenment in particular, the need to step away from a naive reading of the Bible, the need to think differently about religion, uh, about history, development of ideas in history, and particularly by the 18th century, the enormous influx of ideas suddenly coming in from all these other religions around the world. The whole thing was, was making it implausible to say, well, the only coherent story we have is that of the Bible. And therefore, uh, for many, either polemically or simply professionally, to step away from a Christian commitment and become historians of religion, scholars of religion, aim at the science of religion, uh, the field of comparative religion, which even today implies kind of a tone of uh, distance, dispassion. Um, I'll, I'll do my work in comparative religion, and you'll never know whether I believe in either of them because I'm doing it objectively. I think that has had a great effect, just as historical critical studies of the Bible have had a very good effect on helping to understand those books. But I think what happened was that there became this bifurcation, this split between the study of these texts and the academic analysis and anything about the faith life of the scholar or the faith life of the community. Like you do faith on the weekend and you do scholarship during the week. And as a scholar, I'm untainted by faith. And that didn't seem to me to work very well. 
So again, back to my basic thing of, of trying to keep the halves of my life together, saying, well, what is theology? Theology is faith-seeking understanding in the old Catholic definition. There's a certain sense of um, being a believer, um, wanting to understand what you believe and being in the process of trying to do that. So you don't sacrifice your mind for the faith. You don't give up your faith for the sake of your mind. I'm saying if we can do that in, inside the Christian tradition, why can't that be the attitude we bring to learning into religious thing? So faith seeking understanding, but crossing religious boundaries, as I would read uh, classic texts of the Christian tradition, or many a Christian theologian is reading German philosophers and Greek philosophers, I'm reading the Bhagavad Gita, I'm reading the Upanishads, I'm learning from India, um, not, not allowing faith simply to say, I know everything about all this already, but not allowing scholarship to push faith out and suddenly have just an indological, philological understanding of the East, but rather to say it's faith crossing over, faith meeting faith, learning into religiously in a way that does have respect for languages, history, cultures, but then brings back kind of an element of renewal, insight back into one's own starting point, one's tradition. So I call this comparative theology. It could be called interreligious theology if somebody doesn't like the word comparative to distinguish it from, on the one hand, comparative religion, which is sort of a hands-off approach. And on the other extreme, what's called theology of religions, which is often Christian thinking about other religions simply in terms of, is Christ the savior? Can people in that religion, that religion be saved? Often being done by scholars who only know their own tradition and don't actually know the other mm -hmm. tradition. It's sort of abstract. So the comparative theology is not theology of religions, it's not comparative religion, but is this kind of faithful inquiry that doesn't stop at the border of my tradition, but keeps going and then also comes back. And I think it works as a field and does, as you say, Phil, thank you, seems to have a certain um, life to it that there are many people interested in this field and how it works. That's great. Uh, Frank, we could go on forever and yeah. we'll have you back sometime and we can uh, talk further. And I just want to encourage our listeners to, to follow your example. Anybody drawn who, who are not academics, just ordinary seekers and practitioners drawn to learn from other traditions than their own, uh, they can find a lot of inspiration in you and, and right. your work and, and how to go about it. So mm -hmm. thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And I want to, I want to mention the books again, uh, Western Jesuit Scholars in India, Tracing Their Paths, uh, Reassessing Their Goals. The uh, other book, Reading the Hindu and Christian Classics, Why and How Deep Learning Still Matters. Uh, I, I wish I was... Uh, back in school so I could uh, <laughs> take a class with you because I'd like to spend the whole semester yeah. picking your brain. There's a lot to, lot to be gotten there. I would really enjoy it. And, uh, but uh, I shall start with the books. But thank, thank you, you so very much. And I look forward to having you back on. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Hi, Frank. Phil, that was... Uh, Frank Clooney, Father Francis Clooney, Jesuit priest. Uh, and I want to say before we go any further, uh, I, I, for those viewing us, I must say the production quality, the sound quality with our new microphones and everything has really uh, been upgraded. So, uh, you know, you can, you can listen to us as a podcast. You can watch us on a YouTube channel. But wherever you go to see us, whether it's the podcast or YouTube channel, please, we really would appreciate it. It doesn't cost anything. Please subscribe. And, uh, uh, and this is your your contributions at work, folks. We have yeah, that's why we have the mics. <laughs> yeah, they sound better. And, and yeah, for those who have contributed to keep us on the air, thank you very much. And for those that are thinking of doing it, we encourage you to do so. And as I always say, we we're not a nonprofit, so it's not a donation. It's a contribution, but it keeps us going. We have well over 260 shows in the archives and uh, some wonderful people and uh, that we've interviewed. And uh, some of those people will have back on again, especially now that we can be viewed. And everybody's used to looking at Zoom and everything is online. Soon we'll be seeing people in person again. And 
But in uh, any event, uh, he was a great, great interview. I thought he's, uh, like I said in the interview, I'd love to take a class with him. He's very knowledgeable, very scholarly. The oh. Jesuits are the real intellectuals of the Catholic Church. The, the study that goes into becoming a Jesuit is extensive, and they tend to be more open-minded than most. They're not threatened by other religions, other beliefs. That's been my experience with them. And uh, the current Pope, Pope Francis, has also just demonstrated much of that in his life, and he's the first Jesuit <clears throat> uh, to become a, um, uh, a Pope, the Pope. We should point our uh, audience to another recent interview we did on YouTube and on our podcast with uh, Father James Martin, another uh, prominent Jesuit. Uh, Very well known. Uh, he's been on the airwaves. He's on, uh, you know, uh, 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 commercial television. He's uh, been on the Colbert show many times. Yes, which is how we knew about him. But uh, Frank, you know, is, is different because of that... Um, I don't know anybody who has done as much work, certainly in academic circles, bringing together, you know, the Indic traditions and the uh, the Catholic, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Christian traditions, uh, in in a rigorous way, and and in a way that's friendly to both, and right. accepting to both, where there's a kind of. Uh, built in opportunity for people of from each tradition to learn from the other uh in a in a productive way right. yeah uh, father clooney i'll call him father for now uh he is living proof that one can have strong uh, uh belief strong faith be very committed to a particular uh religious tradition in his case catholicism without feeling threatened by other belief systems, by actually embracing them and seeing, okay, what, what, what do we have in common? What can we learn from each other uh, while still maintaining one's uh, uh, faith? So yeah, uh, not, not everyone in Catholicism or any other religion is, is like that. But I think he's, uh, he shows a very enlightened view. And uh, obviously he's, uh, anything he says, he, he can back up because he's done yeah. a tremendous amount of not only research, but you can tell he's uh, introspection, a lot of thinking about it. And, and, it, and in deeply personal ways, not in the objective, mm -hmm. objective sort of uh, detached way of that most Western scholars bring to mm -hmm. looking into Hinduism or Buddhism or you know, anything outside their own faith. Mm -hmm. It's always with a detached critical view, but you know, he lived in India and in Nepal for a time and spent time in temples and no doubt, you know, other, other places where the traditions are alive and allowed it to affect how he understood his own uh, Catholicism, but without abandoning it. There are, of course, many, many people who uh, take up the a study of Hinduism or yogic traditions and just you know abandon their own traditions and there have been jesuits who went to india to be missionaries who ended up doing that they, absolutely i learned two things today that i didn't know uh and one is that uh when he taught at xavier high school in uh, Kathmandu, nepal uh he was told not to proselytize you know teach so i guess i always thought if you went to a, a jesuit school catholic school you had to be catholic but I guess not only did you not have to be Catholic, you didn't have to get married. Although I'm going to guess some of them didn't. The other thing I had no idea, the largest number of Jesuit priests in the world now are from the country of India. There's 4,000. So you rarely hear of anybody becoming any kind of Catholic priest in the United States anymore or none or whatever. But I, I, I think in other countries, it probably happens more frequently. But in India, 4,000. And... Uh, so that's, uh, you know, India has well, a billion people. Percentage-wise, it's not high, but it, that's a lot of priests. This business of not proselytizing, you know, because of the, uh, the British colonial uh, domination mm -hmm. for a few hundred years, the, the urge for uh, uh, people of, that, of people in India to uh, have their children educated uh, in the sort of 
in a Western way to sort of become modernized. Uh, mm. it was it was Western missionaries who started those schools, and right. some were uh, you know intent on converting everybody, uh, but others were very respectful of the tradition and and provided quality education. Vivekananda went to uh, a missionary college. So did Yogananda. So did uh, Srila Prabhupada. They went to Scottish church. Uh, what was a Scottish rites college in Calcutta. And, you know, they obviously didn't convert. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, and no, when, I, when I was in India, I mean, the hotel staff where I stayed, I'd speak to them sometimes. Oh, yeah, they went to Catholic schools. Yeah. Whether or not they were Catholic, I, don't, I assumed at the time they were, but maybe they weren't. No, but, it, I, but I think that's a great attitude. Yeah, because was, then yeah, uh, people that are really modern, drawn are drawn. You're not. Yeah. Modern Western style education. Of course, the Brits were all over that, wanting to educate the Hindu population to make them good subjects of the British Raj. <laughs> you know, so. And, didn't work <laughs> and, and, you, know, you see it a lot i i mean i've been to churches in india and mm -hmm. in fact last time i was in in uh, southern india i'm sure frank's been to this place uh saint thomas uh you know the direct apostle of, of you know disciple of jesus went to india and uh died there and there's a big cathedral uh, on the site where he uh, was. And um, we visited there the last time I was in it. This is in Chennai. Um, and um, stumbled into a wedding. And it was fascinating because it looked, you know, there was a priest with a collar, Indian, officiating over this wedding with this couple. But, you know, the family and all these people, they were all in traditional saris. And it looked like, you know, just any gathering of Indian people. And mm -hmm. the, the decor in the church was some kind of mix of <laughs> cultural motifs, but, you know, all about, you know, Jesus and, and typical sort of stained glass stuff. It was fascinating. Yeah, that's what I asked him about. Where do they draw the line? And he's obviously given that a lot of thought. And I think some people probably wouldn't be as flexible as him. And also, it was interesting, and I want to refer people to your books, American Veda, where you get into uh, some of this. And also, your book on Yogananda, where, you know, Yog Yogananda goes, he, he has, I think it's some. I have it. It's a, I haven't read the whole thing, but it's three volumes on Christ, and it's really extensive and... Uh, 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 very thought through. And if you go to the uh, temple area in, uh, in Los Angeles, uh, that, that, that park that Yogananda has, uh, it's the shrine. Uh, it, it has um, uh, a statue of Christ. So, but anyway, Phil, great, great interview. Yeah, it, 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 um, I hope we ha uh, can have him back. There's so much more to explore, but um, it was great. That so was stay, great. stay tuned. And please hit that subscribe button, whether you're, it doesn't cost anything, whether you're listening or viewing us and uh, share us with everyone. Till next time. All right, Dennis. Cheers.